And we're live. Welcome back to another episode of the Wheelie Podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Micah Toll, and we're joined again by Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good. Awesome. So we've got a number of different stories to talk about this week. There's some big news in the last uh, couple of weeks. Looks like uh, a sampling of the stories here include uh, e-bike uh, e maker Cowboy just revealed a bunch of data about uh, how electric bikes offer significant exercise. There's a new e-bike called the Baby Maker 2 coming out. Uh, we got a chance to review the Model Y from Electric Bike Company, a very California cruisery bike. There's been some Harley Davidson news we'll talk about, uh, a new electric motorcycle coming out, as well as an interesting product that's actually getting as many sales in their electric lineup as their electric motorcycles. Let's see, uh, Jeep's got a new electric scooter, believe it or not, and there's a new German electric scooter coming out that's got some pretty interesting styling. So uh, let's see, where are we going to start this week, Seth? All right, popular e Bike Maker reveals data showing electric bikes offer similar exercise benefits to pedal bikes. So you should say right off the bat that the source is probably inclined to, you know, skew on the side of exercise is good for you and our bikes do that. But let's get into it. Yeah, definitely. So this data does come from Cowboy. They're a uh, Belgian based uh, e-bike maker. So um, you know, take it with a, a bit of a grain of salt there, though this is data that's gleaned from their app. So they shared uh, uh, basically the average data from all of their riders that they've captured with their smartphone app. And what they showed was pretty interesting. Uh, they found that their riders were doing, on average, uh, nine bike rides a week, which each ride averaged about four and a half kilometers or, or just under three miles, I think. So about 25 miles or so a week uh, per rider. And then they also shared uh, sort of an equivalent to what that's like. So they said that's, uh, I think it was 650 calories or so a week from e-bike rides. And that's equivalent to about 90 minutes or so of jogging for the average person, which when you think about it that way, it's, you know, most people find it a little difficult to squeeze an hour and a half of jogging into a week, but that's basically what all of their riders are doing on average when you calculate it across all of their electric bike rides. They yeah. also uh, shared a few. If you're adding that to your commute, which you're going to do already, that's a that's an extra bonus. Like you're killing. Yeah, two definitely. For sure. Yeah, and and it's interesting because Cowboy they make these very um, sort of urban transit e-bikes you know these are not long range e-bikes they're not recreational e-bikes they're really like you know getting to work getting to the coffee shop kind of thing and so i think it makes sense that they're finding that their riders are really doing a lot of these short trips but it's it's neat to see that that exercise actually adds up over time and 25 miles a week i mean i think most people would find it hard to cycle 25 miles a week because you know it's it's tough to get out there and put in those miles when you don't have that electric assist making it more fun and, and quicker uh, i mean seth i know you're into cycling both electric and non-electric so maybe you have a different perspective there than me who's purely an e-cyclist what do you think well so most of my cycling lately it's winter here uh has been uh on the peloton so uh that you know i i do i don't know probably about 50 miles a week on the peloton which is you know, really zero miles, but um, <laughs> exercise wise, um, that's that's still pretty fantastic to get uh, 25 miles of you know, just bonus uh, exercise in a week. Um, because, you know, th those 50 miles I, I get a week are probably, you know, they probably take me, I don't know, probably about two and a half hours. So that's saving me an hour and a half on the Peloton. That'd be, that'd be a pretty big bonus per week. Um, so I don't know. It's obviously, uh, depends on what kind of e-bike you have. If you have like one of those, uh, you know, like a super 73 and you don't really use the pedals that much, you're not going to get as far. Uh, these are, uh, I think cowboys are a non-throttle, right? Correct. So, uh, you pretty much have to do some work. Um, even if you have it on the highest setting to get the bike to move at all. Um, so that's in a way that's good. And, you know, my, my daily driver e-bike is a, um, is a, uh, class three, um, 
without a throttle and I, you know, that's my preferred way to get around. So I, d- I definitely love that aspect and I'm, you know, I'm in my late forties. So it's not like uh, something young, young people are young people only can do. Um, so cool. Should we move on? Yeah. What do we have coming up next here? All right. Electric bicycle company, FLX, or is it just Flix? I'm not sure. I've always read it. I always go with FLX. It's a good okay. question, though. Electric bicycle company, FLX, is back with its Baby Maker 2, which is a great name, e-bike. And this time, it's personal. Tell us about this. Yes. So the, um, the Baby Maker was a sort of darling of the crowdfunding world a couple of years ago, I guess. They launched it in March of 2020 which was a tricky time because, you know, a lot happened in uh, March of 2020 in the world. Yeah. What, what exactly so, happened in March of 2020? Uh, yeah, the whole world got turned on its head, which, right. I mean, it, it sort of messed up everything in the world. But for e-biking, the whole e-bike industry exploded in popularity because suddenly everybody wanted to, you know, get out of quarantine, be on a bike, get out of the bus. And so they launched at that time and they raised like $13 million selling like I think six or 7,000 of these baby maker e-bikes. I'm not exactly sure why they went with that name. Um, I, I mean, I think it was largely, that. yeah, it's, I, it made a name for itself. Let's put it that way. Like the marketing was, was pretty good. You, yeah. They got a lot of press out of that. I think. <laughs> I mean, I always thought like <clears throat> it was like a joke when a girl would punch another girl in the stomach, it would be like punched her in the baby maker or something. Is that, is that is that what baby makers from or where does that even come from? I'm not sure that's exactly the the connotation they were going for. Right. But to be honest, that's the best explanation I've heard yet. Okay. So it could be. But uh, I mean, it's also it's one of these like very sort of road fitness looking bikes, um, narrow saddles, which you think would be counter to the baby making idea. Right. But uh <laughs> It's, I mean, it's a cool looking bike. I mean, very lightweight, very stealthy belt drive. The original had a Gates carbon belt. It also had Magura hydraulic disc brakes, which are like really high end hydraulic brakes, probably much higher end than is necessary for a uh, mid-level e-bike like this. But it's cool that they put such nice parts on the first one. And so now they've got this Baby Maker 2 coming out. I don't really know too much about what is new yet they they have a sort of teaser page on their site that they're um teasing a new indiegogo for this launch and they've got a coupon there for a thousand dollars off which should give you an indication that it's not going to be a cheap bike if they can take a thousand dollars off though the last model sold for two thousand so i don't know if it's going to be a 50 percent off or not but if they stick with a similar price tag that would be pretty impressive and so we'll have to see what kind of different changes and updates they're making on the baby maker 2. um one thing that it did mention on the teaser page was a larger battery though we don't know exactly how much larger yet so hopefully we'll get some more information soon but it was a hugely popular crowdfunding campaign the first time around and so i got to imagine that there will be a lot of people that are excited for the second version especially since it's this you know sort of uh, fitness, almost fixie looking style bike that has been pretty popular lately with several companies making similar styles. I mean, this is probably somewhat similar looking to your, uh, was it your rally e-bike, Seth? Yeah, uh, a little bit. Um, that one's kind of more of a, uh, a I want to say fusion bike, not a fusion bike, but, um, but yeah, it is, it's a, a rally redux IE from 2017. Um, I was also thinking, like with the Gates carbon belt drive, it's a little bit similar to the uh, the Luna. What what is that one called? The Luna fixed. Yeah, I think it's the fixed exactly. Yeah, and uh, similar specs as well. Like uh, not too powerful, but motor, kind of a low uh, power battery. Uh, it looks like like to to the untrained eyes, some people might not even know it's an e bike. Um, that's kind of the same. Yeah, thing definitely. Luna. Yeah, and, I mean, this one, when you look at it, you definitely wouldn't think this was an e-bike at first. Even the motor in the rear wheel is so small that it just disappears behind the disc rotor. You, you can't even really see it. And do we, we have 
specs wise on this um did they give anything well, only for the uh original baby maker it went 25 miles an hour or 40 kilometers per hour and it had i believe a 36 volt uh six or seven amp hour battery not very big so you know definitely a a small pedal assist style battery but it was reasonable specs reasonably fast class three you know not all the way up to 28 but 25 miles per hour is still respectable yeah totally um and the motor's like what 250 watt you said or 350 i believe it was 350 yeah i mean it's probably um you know being over vaulted maybe it was like a you know 24 volt 250 watt motor that they are running on 36 because most 20 uh 250 volt or 350 I'm sorry, 250 watt or 350 watt motors don't make it to 25 miles an hour. So I'm guessing they're running that motor a little hot. Interesting. Um, so what do we think for upgrades? Like what are you, what, I mean, it sounds like it's going to be more expensive. What do you think they're, they're adding to this thing to make it uh, more expensive and, you know, version two? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say because they put such good components on it to begin with, like with the Gates drive and those nice Magura brakes. So the, the bigger battery is an obvious, easy upgrade. Someone pointed out in the comments that it looks like it now has fender mounts, which I didn't even realize the first one was missing, but that definitely makes sense for sort of an urban bike like this. Yeah. Um, other than that, perhaps, you know, a slightly nicer display. The first one had that sort of simplified, tiny uh, LCD screen. Um, but there's there's not much else I can see here that that looks that different from the original. So I'm not sure what to expect when they actually announce the changes. I do notice there's like uh, that black circle there um, uh, at the uh, the front. I wonder if there's going to be like some app uh, stuff like GPS or, you know, some of the tricks that Van Move does. Um, that would be an interesting addition, I guess. Yeah, that's true. There could be some of those smart features that, you know, we can't see from here that would have been in integrated and, and that could be a neat addition if they can work that in. All right. Sounds exciting. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, we're moving on to the electric bike company Model Y review. I don't know why that Model Y sounds familiar. Uh, getting California Cruiser vibes on a U.S. made e-bike. Yeah, so the uh, electric bike company, for anyone who's not familiar, uh, they've been around a while. I want to say since 2014 or 2015. I mean, to get the name electric bike company, you've got to be one of the first ones, right? So uh, they, they've been kicking around for a while with a number of designs. We actually got to visit them in 2019 to see their factory there in Newport Beach, California. And they've since expanded into a number of buildings uh, down there in Newport. And that's the really cool thing that separates them apart is that they actually build their bikes there in Southern California, as opposed to most companies that have them built in an Asian factory. And then they bring them in like 90% assembled in a bike box, and then it gets shipped to you straight from a warehouse. So, you know, most US e-bike companies don't actually touch the bikes once they get stateside. Here with Electric Bike Company, they build it all up from the bare frame. And a lot of the components, they actually produce themselves. So like the batteries are assembled there. The fenders are actually made there in their wood shop, if you choose the wood fenders. Um, and it's all done locally, the wheel building. And so we got to check out the factory and test this Model Y, which is their, uh, they call it the women's bike. I mean, these days, a step through bike is just kind of like another frame. This one's like powder blue and it's got like the nice fuzzy blue basket. It's, you know, kind of decked out in what you could say are like, you know, women friendly colors. But I think anybody who likes a, a step through bike and, you know, likes these pastels would, would enjoy this, this style of bike. I wrote yeah, it, uh, I feel like it's no longer a PC to, to even delineate women and men's bikes. Uh, yeah, seems like we, an artifact. Yeah, we should just call it step through or whatever. Yeah, well, it's, it's definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's that sort of Dutch style cruiser, you know, with the step through frame and the the nice big balloon tires. And this one actually has suspension, but uh, you can get the model. You can get the same model actually without suspension. Mm -hmm. And so just those big balloon tires really make for a nice ride. I mean that's what cruisers are about, right? Like that's the you know, quintessential California cruiser bike is 
cruising along the beach path with those big tires, low and slow. And, and that's kind of the feeling you get with this bike, except for the slow part, because it's actually a class three that'll go up to 28 miles an hour. So it's, yeah. it's got some nice pep. It's uh, it's got a thousand watt peak motor and it's just real nice and comfortable to ride. The only thing that I didn't really like about it were that the cruiser handlebars are so cruisery and like pulled back that your hands are sort of angled forwards. I'm just used to like, you know, straight flat mountain bike bars. Right. And so the cruiser bars, it's just like a whole new feeling. You know, it's like I've got one of those big 60s steering wheels in my hands. Right. So, I mean, that's a personal choice thing. You could probably put straighter bars on if you want, but the big, you know, curved cruiser bars definitely fit with this type of California cruiser inspired bike. But uh, I mean, it's, it's really beautiful what they've done there. It's a, it's a great looking bike. It rides well. Uh, my wife and I both rode it. Uh, she came out with me during that trip to California and we had a lot of fun on it. It was just a, a really cool bike and it's only, I think nineteen hundred and forty nine dollars is the starting oh, wow. price. Yeah, and that's I mean you're paying for Americans. Ask. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Like you would you would expect it to be a lot more. Now the price does go up if you do all the customizations, and that's really where electric bike company shines is that you can customize like everything on it. So if you do your custom paint colors, which they have a paint booth right there, um, if you do like those nice wooden fenders where you add all the different accessories, the price goes up quickly. I mean, you can get these things into like $3,000 if you really deck them out. But uh, even just, you know, the starting model is is really fairly priced considering they're, they're literally building these up from bare frames right there, paying American wages, which I think is really cool. I mean, how many e-bike companies are doing that, literally building e-bikes here in the US? Yeah, that's great to see. And especially like Newport Beach, like that can't be cheap real estate. Um, real yeah. quick, where's the battery on that thing? So it's actually in the front basket. It's in the bottom of it. Oh, so I, you can't I, even see it. And and that one has that blue fuzzy basket liner, which is another one of those accessories right. that, you know, we'll, we'll add to the price. But especially with the liner in there, you just can't see the battery at all. And it's, it's really a, a nice design. So I imagine a lot of people are also thinking this is not an electric bike. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so wait, it doesn't the, the back basket or the front basket? No, it's the front basket. Really? Was the weight at all kind of weird? I know you said the the back handlebars were kind of weird. But, so, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, I didn't find the the battery being up front to feel odd at all. My wife did say that it felt a bit heavy in the front. She's a lot smaller, so it could be that you know if you're petite, then you feel that that extra weight up there even more. But for me, it just sort of felt like a, a long cruiser bike, which already sort of have that sort of slower, heavier feel to them compared to like a nimble street bike or a nimble mountain bike kind of thing. Yeah, I love the look. Like uh, this is, you know, you're making e-biking part of your lifestyle. You definitely want to have some some unique looks. And this is a really nice look, the bike. Um, yeah, I'm surprised we don't see them out there more in terms of like as a lifestyle brand, you know, a company like Super 73, you see them everywhere and they're they're uh, really good at marketing that lifestyle. And I, I'm a bit surprised we don't see more electric bike company bikes out there, or like more celebrities riding these down, you know, the the beach in front of Santa Monica, that sort of thing. So you can customize everything. Uh, they're not thinking about like a, you know, crazy motor on here, obviously. Um can you customize like, you know, beside, can you customize like a bigger battery or, you know? Yeah, so they've, they've got um, several battery options. I think it's like three or four different oh, wow. battery sizes. Uh, it starts at, I think, eight amp hours is the smallest. They're all 48 volts. So you can start at like eight amp hours. And I think it goes up to like 30 or 40 because they can really fill that basket up and then they can put a rear rack battery on it um and then they have, have different models so they have models that have batteries in the middle of the bike and they have some actually that black bike that you see there uh, has the battery inside the frame that's a model e okay and so they've got i think six or seven different models at this point it's it's hard to keep track because they keep adding more model lines but uh, they have a number of different styles and so they have different types of batteries to fit the different bikes and each one can add you know, a front basket battery and a, a rear basket battery. Can you opt for only the rear basket battery? Or is, or is I, it... 
I think you can. Um, the Model Y specifically, I think, comes with the, the front basket standard, but I think you can have it switched to a rear, and they might even have that set up as a different model. It's a little okay. bit hard to keep track of all the different models now. Well, the customization is nice, and uh, looks like an awesome bike. Yeah, and the, um, the Model C, which is like sort of the... Um, normal framed version with the high uh, top tube. It's also a, a classic cruiser style, but it's got the rear rack basket. And the cool thing about that one is the uh, basket, or sorry, the rear battery holder has the charger built into it. So there's actually a like 110 volt um, wire, you know, with a plug on it that you pull out of the rear battery on a reel, like a vacuum cleaner or something. And you just plug it straight into the wall. And so you don't have to carry a charger with you. That's cool. Yeah, I always love that. Um, yeah, they've, they've done a good job with these. There's some nice designs. Well, they, I mean, I, I, I assume so, but you can can you buy some of these accessories just on their own uh, for your current e-bike? That's a good question. Um, I imagine you could. I don't see why they wouldn't sell them to you. Um, you could probably just buy them without having bought a, a bike straight off of their website. But I think right. they've sort of selected all of these to you know fit each of their bikes on different areas but i imagine you could uh if you already have your own e-bike grab some of these because they do have a nice selection of uh, accessories there i'll have to make a note to send this to my wife because she's been thinking about something like this well she should check out on their website the customizer because like you can go through and you can literally build your e-bike like right before your eyes choose all the paint colors the frame the fenders the chain guard can choose like you know black or chrome trims like handlebars pedal crank seat post all of that can be black or chrome so it's kind of fun uh she'll probably enjoy just picking everything out my wife was must have spent like 20 minutes just like playing with all the different colors and all the different combinations that's cool all right moving up the uh the uh power curve a little bit uh harley davidson's new lower cost electric motorcycle coming in q2 under livewire sub brand so this is yeah, the so first this first, is uh under livewire right yeah this is uh really exciting um so there's i guess we got to give a little bit of history here to sort of understand how harley davidson got to this point so uh just to try to like squeeze this in real quick Starting like 2014, Harley Davidson starts developing Project Livewire to build an electric motorcycle, which I think makes them either the first or one of the first legacy motorcycle manufacturers to start going electric. It took them until 2019 to actually get the bike out. That was the Harley Davidson Livewire. And it was an awesome motorcycle, but it was pretty expensive at $30,000. So they sold that through 2021 under the Harley Davidson nameplate. But then late last year, they decided to spin off a new sub brand called Livewire, and that would be all of their electric stuff. So uh, both the Harley Davidson Livewire motorcycle and the projects that they were already working on. So that was the end of last year. This new Livewire brand started. They sort of relaunched the Livewire motorcycle as the Livewire One. And now we're getting news of this second Livewire motorcycle which will be the second electric model created by harley and it is supposed to be a sort of middleweight motorcycle probably more affordable than the original uh, harley davidson livewire which launched at thirty thousand and now costs twenty two thousand dollars as the livewire one there's no word yet on what this new uh, bike could cost but we are starting to get an idea of what it's going to look like it's uh called the del mar and it's based on harley davidson's or I guess now Livewire's new platform called the Aero platform. And that's sort of the center section of the bike. It's the um, battery, which is a structural battery. So you notice there's no frame around it. It basically is the frame. It's got the motor uh, built into that housing along with the electronics. So the speed controller, the um, charger, all of that is built into that Aero platform. And so that's what they're going to use to build that... Uh, next electric motorcycle and then in the future we'll probably see more motorcycles built on that same aero platform that are going to give us more of these sort of lightweight and middleweight electric motorcycles it's too soon to know any tech specs unfortunately you know it'd be great to know what size battery we're talking about what kind of range they're going to be able to offer 
especially assuming this is going to be less battery than the 15 and a half kilowatt hours on the live wire one. If it's going to be, you know, less than that, then it'll be interesting to find out how much range they can squeeze out of a pretty small battery. Uh, also the power, you know, we, we don't know anything about this motor yet. We do know it's going to be a much simpler motor. The uh, Harley Davidson live wire, which became the live wire one has a pretty interesting yet complicated uh, motor that runs sort of longitudinally along the bike. Then it needs that bevel gear to turn it 90 degrees to get the output in line with the rear wheel. And so this one is a much simpler direct drive motor that's already in line with the rear wheel. And so it doesn't require that complicated transmission and should help make it, you know, simpler to produce cheaper everything. So we don't know the tech specs yet, but we know the, the basic design here for the Del Mar bike. And it's looking pretty interesting. It, it also will open the door to hopefully bringing more riders in, make it more accessible because it's not a $22,000 bike anymore. What do you think of the design, Seth? I love the design. Um, I'm wondering price wise, like, you know, we have like a pretty wide spectrum these days. Like you go all the way down to like the Saunders or even like the CC or whatever at, you know, 5,000 ish. And then, you know, go up to the 22,000 live wire. Is this going to compete with like the zero FX or is this like, where is this going to fall? Do you think price wise and, and specs wise? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, I mean, until we know the the tech specs, it's hard to say, but I'm guessing it's going to be in line with either the um, Zero FX and the like Zero S uh, bikes, which are something like, uh, I want to say 30 kilowatts, something like that, or potentially the next step up, which would be Zero's um, middleweight motor. I think it's the ZF75-7, if I'm not mistaken. That's like their... Um, uh, SR, DSR, and it's something like 50, 55 kilowatts. So it could compete with either of those levels. The Zero's highest level um, is their SRF and SRS. That's the ZF7510 motor, which is like 80 kilowatts. And that's already comparable to the Livewire 1. So, um, you know, they're already competing with uh, Zero's flagship bikes. So this is probably going to gonna fall in line with one of the two lower weight bikes in Zero's lineup. In terms of pricing, it's hard to say. I'm guessing they're going to fall in line with Zero's pricing because the $22,000 for the Livewire 1 from Harley is just barely above what a new Zero SRS or SRF costs. They're about $20,000 or so. So, you know, you're always going to have to pay a little more for the Harley name on there. Right. It's just, you know, that that's how physics works at, at Harley <laughs> Davidson. But um, I, I think they're going to be competitive with zero at least. And, and they'll be really the first real challenger in terms of volume for zero, because there has been uh, Energica, which is that Italian brand that's really right. expanding in the U.S., but their volume is just so much lower than um, than we see from zero that they haven't really been a a true competitor in terms of sales or market share. Cool. Um, and, you know, this will be a highway capable bike for sure, right? Okay. Yeah, definitely. I mean, th they're working on some mopeds and stuff in the sort of skunk works area of live wire. Um, those obviously will be more the, the urban bikes, but we haven't seen anything close to a production version of the mopeds. So this is definitely going to have to be a, a highway capable bike. And it uh, sort of follows the progression there that the live wire is set, that they started with their flagship bike. Now they're moving towards these middleweight bikes that are still going to be, you know, certainly effective as, as highway vehicles, but they're really meant for more um, uh, broad spectrum usage. You can commute on it. You can use it in the city and it can do highway riding. And then only later do we expect that they're going to come out with those mopeds and the the smaller bikes, which I'm actually really excited about. I want to see those I am mopeds. Too. I, I looked at it and I was like, wow, that's going to be really fun. And it's, what's kind of cool about this is it's kind of modular. Like you could take this uh, battery motor combination off <clears throat> pretty easily, it seems like. Um, so like, I don't know, it would be easy to like upgrade to a bigger battery motor combination in this i mean we're looking at um one of harley's uh, prototypes that were you know when carly even announced that they were going to build electric bikes they showed some stuff like this which got everybody well, at least got us very very excited about their, their full lineup 
Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think that that modular idea that you're talking about, it, it fits really nicely with that Aero platform they've developed because they're talking about trying to make, you know, a couple platforms that they can build many different bikes on top of. So if they could do that with that moped and, you know, have like a 25 mile an hour one and maybe a 45 mile an hour one by just swapping out the uh, motor and battery, that would be a pretty cool idea. I would I would love that. Yeah, I mean, you could even you know buy the frame and upgrade it later, or trade it in, whatever. All right, so I'm gonna get. What are you gonna guess for price on this thing? Oh man, it's it's. I feel like I'd want to know the battery specs first, but if I had to guess, I could see them coming in around fifteen thousand dollars or so. Okay, that would yeah. put them close to the um, like the DSR price from zero, so like their middleweight bikes, and mm -hmm. I think that would be fairly competitive. Maybe it'd be a bit higher. Again, you're you know paying for that HD label, but I think that would be sort of a sweet spot for their second bike. Yeah, it's not just the label. I think Harley spends a little bit of time, extra time on design and you know whatever. Uh, it just feels like they they build for a you know a, a higher spec. You know, just like their serial one bikes, they everything's spec to the top and also designed really well. So yeah, um, they have a uh, yeah, yeah. Well, their their design legacy also runs a lot longer, right? I mean, right. They, they've been around for over a hundred years, so they've got a lot to live up to, as opposed to a new startup that can come in and just roll out bikes that doesn't have to live up to any you know legacy or heritage. And then also, I think something that is important to consider when you think about why you know Harley's might cost a little bit more is you've also got a local dealer network. You know, right. I, I love zeros, but you might be many hundreds of miles away from a zero dealer, depending where you live with Harley's. If you need support or service, there's probably one pretty close to where you live. Yeah. And they have a charger at their, at the station or at the dealership as well. It's nice to have. Um, oh yeah. So talking about chargers, um, I'm assuming this is probably going to have the similar, uh, charging profile as as the live wire where it's got level one and level three but not a level two really yeah, it's a good question because there were a lot of people that were upset that the live wire didn't have level two charging now it, it can charge with sort of a level two connector right but uh, it only charges at level one rates so if this did have level two charging that would answer that that question and sort of touch on that pain point that a lot of people had and if it retained the level three charging that the live wire one has that would be a huge win because i know there are a lot of people that would like for zeros to have a level three option so right. if they could have everything on one bike wow that would be just i mean that would be incredible yeah, and I, I love that the side look of the you know, the battery it looks like it might also be functional as a cooling mechanism uh so they don't have have fans or whatever yeah it's um i'm not sure how they plan on cooling that they definitely have some pretty aggressive fins on the side so maybe it is air cooled i'm not sure that would certainly simplify things if they don't have to liquid cool it so last question when is this going to be in people's hands or when do you think it will be uh, excellent question so they said by the end of quarter two so oh. if they stay on track I mean, that's four months away from now. That's, yeah, that's pretty that, close. That means you're going to Milwaukee probably, right? Hopefully. <laughs> um, Let's see if they stay on track. Yeah. Uh, so stay, sticking with uh, Harley, uh, the next story is over 50% of Harley Davidson's electric revenue came from selling kids' bikes, not motorcycles. I didn't know that. Yeah. So this is a bit surprising. So uh, again, a little context here. There's the um, electric kids balance bikes. So not, you know, electric bicycles like we think of with pedals, but something meant for like two-year-olds, three-year-olds that is just a balance bike with no pedals. And it's got a little like drill battery on it so they can actually push a button and like get up to speed and, you know, practice balancing on a bike. So these are, uh, I think it's the Stay Psych or Stay Psych. I'm not sure even how you pronounce that company. Uh, but Harley Davidson bought them back in 2019 and they've been under the HD brand ever since. And as it turns out, 
thanks to uh, Harley Davidson's recent financial reporting, we've learned that they've actually made a lot of money selling these over the last uh, 33 months or so since the beginning of 2019. They've raked in uh, $41 million selling these balance bikes, which by itself is impressive. But what's really interesting is they also shared how much they made selling live wire electric motorcycles, and it doesn't add up to $41 million. It was actually wow. closer to, uh, I believe, $30 million. However, and there's like a little bit of an asterisk here, they included in that accounting about $15 million of concessions to HD dealers who invested a lot of money in uh, installing equipment and upgrades, which I assume means those level three uh, DC fast chargers. So um, they actually pulled in closer to $45 million in live wire sales. And then they uh, took $15 million off the top that they essentially paid back, it appears, to their various dealers for all of their investments. So in actuality, they made a little more money selling live wire motorcycles than these kids' electric balance bikes. But I think it, it still tells two interesting stories. One is that it was a great investment to buy that kid's e-bike company because they spent six million bucks on that reportedly, and they've brought in a lot of revenue from it already. And the second thing is that it shed some interesting light on how many motorcycles Livewire's actually sold. So, or I guess Harley Davidson before the Livewire subbrand was released. So it shows that they actually um, they sold wholesale. 1600 uh electric motorcycles and retail sales it's something like 1350 or so so they've got about 250 bikes floating around out there that haven't been sold I'm guessing that means they're still sitting at dealers or maybe that's part of harley's um like trial fleet for for people that want to you know try motorcycles i'm not sure how they sort of account for those bikes but uh, it gives an idea that they've actually sold about um or at least produced about 1600 motorcycles, which we haven't had a great idea of how many uh, motorcycles have been sold in the Livewire brand yet. And so it, it gives us a little bit of clarity there. And while it's hard to compare that to other electric motorcycle companies, you know, Zero's private, um, so we don't have an idea of how many they sell. We do know that Harley Davidson says the Livewire is the number one best-selling electric motorcycle in the US, which probably means compared to any one of Zero's models, it sells more, even right. though Zero likely sells more total each year. But it's still interesting to be able to finally get some some real numbers out of Harley Davidson to see how many electric motorcycles they're moving. Yeah, Zach on our uh, uh, nine to five Mac team uh, has a, a live wire and raves about it. Like if you follow his Instagram, it's pretty much live wire uh, advertising. Uh, so it's good to see that people are, are really enjoying the, these electric motorcycles. Um, yeah, I have to imagine that they're going to be collector's items at some point, because if right. there are only 1,600 bikes out there, I mean, that's that's not a ton. And no. I think a third of them or so were sold outside the U.S. So maybe there's a thousand or so in the U.S. That's not that many bikes out there. So he might have a, a collector's item there. Yeah, that's cool. Um, all right. And. Moving on to uh, Jeep's new off-road electric scooter for adults unveiled today, showcasing partnership with Razor. So tell us about this. So uh, this is Jeep's first electric scooter. Uh, it was a partnership with Razor. So Jeep didn't like, you know, hit the drawing board and design their own scooter from the ground up. What it appears is this is lar largely a um, licensing partnership. So Razor took a base model that they've had, which I believe is the uh, RX 200. And they worked with Jeep on the licensing. I think Jeep probably specified a few things, maybe like, you know, sort of rugged looking tires. They added these big sort of Jeep-like uh, off-road lights that are mounted on the handlebars. So there's actually two of them next to each other. So they look like these big, you know, like rock crawler lights you'd see out there, uh, you know, in the desert, that sort of thing. But really what this is, is sort of like a pretty basic electric scooter. The specs are not impressive by any stretch of the imagination. It's like uh, 200 watts in the motor. Um, it's also a chain driving motor, so it's not even a hub motor. It's it's pretty old technology. Oh, really? the, yeah, the, the batteries are lead acid, if you can believe that. Oh. And when's the last time you saw lead acid batteries? Wow. 
yeah, that's like that's... A, a willy they should call this like the willy scooter <laughs> Yeah, it, it definitely harkens back to that age. I mean, I think there were lead acid batteries in the wheelies. I mean, you know, it's serving a different role, but uh, I mean, this thing is is not a um, you know specimen of modern day technology by by any means. the The battery also it's it's tiny. It's one hundred and sixty eight watt hours. So yeah, I mean, that's a little five say, eight miles. Looking at it, it looked pretty cool. Hearing this stuff. Uh, a little disappointing i have to say like i mean jeep built some pretty good like they didn't build anything but they they licensed some pretty good electric bikes uh this is not the same thing at all yeah definitely and it i mean it really shows that who you partner with is important here right. because i'm sure they wanted electric scooters so they thought like who do you go to well razor is like you know a household scooter name but I, I'm not sure Razor even chose the right model here because they have better um, models in their lineup. I mean, they've got uh, hub motors, they've got lithium batteries. Like it's it's like they went into the closet to find all the old parts and they assembled like an old fashioned scooter here. I don't know what they were thinking or or why Jeep would have wanted to put all of their decals on something like this because there's just so many better scooter options out there. Yeah. That's little disappointing but you know somebody is gonna like that look so good for them all right last story of the week new high-speed german electric scooter offers modern styling breaks from competitors love the look of this thing yeah so um for anyone listening and not seeing the youtube version of this podcast you're missing out a little bit because this is a really cool looking electric scooter it's a seated scooter so sort of vespa style in that you're you're sitting on it you've got that front shield in front of you but the styling doesn't really follow vespa at all unlike so many of the other vespa knockoffs that we've seen in the electric scooter space it's really like a very angular um just like you know sharp edges almost like a futuristic design on this german electric scooter and it's it's a really neat concept even the front shield is actually clear uh, up until about the um, middle of the suspension fork there so you can actually look through it and I guess you could probably see you know obstacles on the road that are like three feet in front of you that sort of thing um, but it's just got a very different type of design than we've seen before and it's really nice to see a just total different direction to to go than the classic Vespa knockoff that we just see so often. And I don't know. What do you think of the design, Seth? I love it. Um, it's, it's, you're right. It's a total like rethinking of the scooter. And I didn't even notice the the windshield thing down there. Um, you, you normally think of windshields on uh, scooters and, and motorcycles to uh, help with um, aerodynamics. And this certainly does. But the fact that you can see down like where your uh, bike tire is, is, is a huge benefit for, you know, avoiding potholes at slow speeds and stuff like that. So I, I definitely love this thing. The, the downside I'm immediately thinking is like, you know, where, what, what kind of storage do you have? Yeah, so they actually have under seat storage and they say it's enough for, they called it a fighter style helmet, which I assume means like a three quarter helmet. Um, mm -hmm. It's like those helmets that they gave us in Munich when we were riding the, the UNU scooters. Yep. So, um, you know, there's anything that can hold a helmet at least gives you decent storage. I mean, that's like one bag of groceries, perhaps not a ton, but it's better than no storage at all. Certainly. Right. And you can always put some stuff between your legs. Um, I know I've, I've seen a lot of scooter riders do that. Um, oh yeah. Are absolutely. there any, you know, like, uh, add-ons that would, you know, put, put, uh, additional storage on here? Well, that's the thing is I'm not sure how you would mount like a storage box on the back. Um, you know, I have a uh, new and NIU NGT scooter and I actually just got a storage box to put on the back because I was tired of having to put groceries between my feet, basically like you just described. Right. So I, I don't know how you would sort of add on those types of conventional aftermarket products that are designed for typical scooters unless they've sort of thought of that and they've got some sort of standard mount back there. But that's also sort of the downside of going with such a new and, 
and out there design is that it's probably not going to fit a lot of the standard aftermarket accessories. Yeah, I guess uh, get a big backpack. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of motorcycle and scooter riders are used to having to backpack it every now and again. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, if, if you could if you could fit some sort of storage box on there, especially if they made one that fit that design. So it right. sort of looked like the seat there with those really sharp angles and like, it's all kind of like trapezoidal. I mean, it almost looks like a, like a black cyber truck, right? Right. A little bit. Um, and two people can fit on this, right? Or maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh design for two people. And the cool thing is the uh, running boards there, which you don't normally have running boards on a scooter like this. Right. But they extend all the way back there. So right. you don't have foot pegs for the rear passenger. Um, they actually put their feet on the same sort of running board that the rider's feet would go on. So it's a, a neat design in that way, too. And there's just like a lot of space on there. So if someone might have felt a little bit uncomfortable doing 60 miles an hour standing on little tiny pegs, you've got a nice big foot platform for your pillion back there to feel comfortable. All right. So specs wise... Um... The, it reaches a top speed of 62 miles per hour, which coincidentally is, you know, kind of highway speed. But is it rated for highway or is it is it a scooter motorcycle thing? How does that work? I mean, it's so first of all, it's German. So uh, it fits into there, I believe, the L3E category. So theoretically, you could take this on a highway, but it's really meant for like, you know, city and maybe ring road usage. You wouldn't want to go too long on a highway on it. Because, you know, it only goes 62 miles an hour or 100 kilometers per hour. But right. you could. There's also a slower version of the scooter that's uh, an L1E. So it goes up to, I believe, um, 45 kilometers per hour, which is 28 miles an hour, I think. And so if you're just staying in the city, that one would be, you know, cheaper and, and more, um, you know, uh, efficient for city riding. But I think I would definitely prefer the higher powered one. Yeah. So uh, specs... 10 kilowatt peak on the, the higher one, seven kilowatt, I guess, nominal, um, and a 2.4 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, that means, you know, range of, they're saying 140 kilometers or 87 miles. Uh, that sounds a little optimistic, but. Um, well, that's actually with a second battery added. Perfect. So you can have uh, two of those 2.4 kilowatt hour batteries, and they're actually okay. under the. Um, uh, floorboards there. So they're pretty low, probably gives you a nice low center of gravity. And that's are why they, you also have that storage area. Are they modular like the new or the, uh, you know, the other, I think there's like three different modular batteries that I can think of right now. Um, right. Oh, like the GoGoRo or something? GoGoRo, yeah. Yeah. So um, they are those sort of like removable packs. I don't think they've shown any pictures of the battery removed yet. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what they look like, but they did say that they're removable, okay. which is good because, you know, a lot of scooter riders are city residents, you know, might live on the 10th floor of an apartment building and being able to take the battery out so you can just bring it off the elevator and charge in your living room is a nice benefit. Yeah. And 2.4 kilowatts is going to be heavy, but not insurmountably heavy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's probably 25, 30 pounds or so per battery, which is manageable not you know a fun lift but uh right certainly doable by an average person that's about what my batteries weigh in my uh new ngt and if okay. anything i found that taking both of them out is the best way to do it because when you just carry one you're really lopsided so carrying two heavy batteries keeps you nice and even so you're not hanging over to one side like you're doing a farmer's carry yeah totally um i feel like i saw somewhere where they had like a uh I don't know, like a suitcase, not, what is that called? Like a lift? Um, oh yeah. I think is. you're, you're talking about the silent scooter where it's like a, like a carry on luggage with the yeah. little wheels Holders. and a handle that comes out. Yeah. Those yeah, are exactly. Cool. Yeah. That's the, uh, the silence scooter. It's from um, Barcelona. Okay. And uh, it, it's a really cool design there. I think it goes up to like four or five kilowatt hours, which by that point you've got like a 50, 55 pound, battery and so having you know wheels on it and a little handle that comes out yeah. so you roll it along it's a really nice feature For the other sure. cool thing is they made a little like uh, neighborhood electric vehicle that uses two of those batteries oh wow and so you can actually take 
the batteries out of your little electric car and like roll the battery inside and charge it. I feel like I might have seen something like that at uh, IAA, but it might have, it might have been another company. I think it was a Taiwanese based company. But um, all right, so that's uh, it for the stories. We have some uh, commentary in the comments. We should go through here. Um, we have some fans. Thanks for Addy K and uh, Campos. Um, so Baxter92 is saying, I would have said 20K before you said they dropped the price of the live wire. So I wonder if he's saying 20K for the live wire or 20K for the the new one. What do you think? We said 50. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like Baxter thought the uh, the new bike would have been 20, but if the live wire one's already 22, then I, I would see definitely below 20 for the next bike. All right. Um, and then we have another, he's guessing FX specs with an SR price. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe a little bit better than that. And then uh, while batteries are supposedly getting cheaper, it seems like components for batteries are getting more costly or harder to find. When, if ever, do you think the battery cost trend line will flip? Oh, man, that's a good question. It's, you know, if anything, I haven't really seen much advancement in battery technology in years. So really, we've just we've just been limited by materials, like Baxter said, and we're not seeing huge leaps forward in, in tech or prices other than just economies of scale and, and slightly better manufacturing. I mean, Tesla is what are those, the 4680 cells, uh, if those I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah, that might be the best, you know, sort of uh, cost improvement just because the better packaging and the better density. But I haven't seen anything really pushing prices down in a while. Have you? No. And, and because electric vehicles are exploding so much, any uh, improvement in, you know, scale or whatever is kind of offset by the increased demand. So, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to find anything that's, you know, anything like we had seen in, you know, before 2020, the prices kept coming down and the efficiency got a lot better, but it seems like, you know, we're still getting marginal gains and, and, uh, you know, uh, power density and stuff like that. And, and, but the cost because of, you know, the demand is, is kind of stayed pretty even. So hopefully some new, uh, innovation will, will bring down prices a little bit. That's a Absolutely. great question. All right, we got two more questions. Um, one or comments. One is uh, Altima twenty two talking about the Jeep scooter. Shocked that they use lead acid batteries. Yeah, count me in that. I feel like that's like incandescent bulbs. It's like a, a past technology that we shouldn't use anymore. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right there with the Altima. <laughs> and then he goes on to say uh, the motor looks like a windshield wiper motor, which is uh, oh man. Kind of rough, but uh, possibly deserved. Yeah, I was just going to say, not undeserved. <laughs> right. All right, you want to take us out? Awesome. So, yeah, thank you guys, everyone who tuned in with us this week. We'll be back uh, two weeks from now doing the show every fortnight with the next big stories in the electric bike, e-moto, and e-everything small vehicle space. So thanks for watching. Seth, thanks for being here with us. And we'll see you guys in a fortnight.